European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Assemble Plus conference. So we're going to have now a series of talks by Assemble users, Assemble Plus users. And we start first with uh, Jorun Sakalowskaite, sorry about pronunciation, from the University of Turin. And he's going to talk about spondylus multiomics, bridging biomineralization and archaeology, spondylomics. Okay, uh, Jorun, please, you can start. Yeah, good morning to everyone. I will. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Okay, that's great. So good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Actually, um, uh, I am Joruna Sakoloskaya, so I'm a recent PhD graduate actually at the University of Turin, and I will speak about shell paleoproteomics. And actually, I will show how Assemble Plus also helped me to investigate my research from that uh, goes from biomization to characterization of fossil proteins in archaeological shells. So my area of research is called shell paleoproteomics, and in simple terms, this uh, bridges to uh, the main aim, the concept of this research is the study of archaeological shells using paleoproteomics, that is the study of ancient proteins. And all of this uh, is grounded on biomineralization research. And this is a multidisciplinary project. And it's interesting to know that it encompasses two scientific areas, which have actually rarely interacted before, that is biomization and archeology. span Biomization is a molecular and physiological process by which the living systems produced mineralized tissues. So shells are organomineral uh, organo -mineral composite materials and they retain a, a fraction of proteins, which can actually be analyzed by proteomics. Shells are also very hard and rigid structures and they preserve really well in paleontological record. And so the main question of paleoproteomics is actually, can we access these proteins from subfossil shells? And this is something that I will be discussing during this presentation. Shells were used since early prehistoric times and actually my, my research mainly uh, focuses on archeological shell ornaments because shell, shell um, ornaments were one of the most widespread cultural heritage objects and they're frequently found in different archeological sites. So shells were used either perforated or they were also used as raw materials and crafted in different types of artifacts. They were used to mark one's personal identity and also show so, so social status to wealth. And it also portrayed symbolic meaning. So actually it was used in ritual, rituals. 
And as you can see in the figure here, this is a burial, very famous. It's called Young Prince. It is dated around 24,000 years ago, and it was uncovered in the archaeological site in north of Italy. So we can see here that the skull of this boy, who was around 18 years old, was covered with an impressive cap that was made of hundreds of treated species shells, a little gastropod uh, shells. An interesting thing to note is that the, during prehistoric times, one of the shells was, was extensively exploited. That is ponderous. It was used to make different types of ornaments, including bracelets, pendants, beads, as well as you can see in the pictures here. And the most common feature is that all of them were heavily standardized and also heavily worked. So actually, if you look here, they all, the, all of these ornaments would not retain almost any of the original features of the natural shell. Now, Spondylus is a Mediterranean shell. It's often called as a, a thorny oyster. It has a very characteristic appearance. It has a deep purple red valve and also these uh, sharp hollow spines. And it usually lives from five to 20 meters in depth uh, attached to seabed. Normally it is covered by the sponge Cramba Gramba, so actually underwater it looks just a little bit different. And in archaeological research, spondylus is very often considered as a prestige raw material, basically because um, artifacts made of the shell were found in a number of archaeological sites that were spread in Central Europe and also uh, reaching as far as north of Europe. So sometimes um, they would be located thousand, hundred or thousand kilometers away from Mediterranean coast where they actually could have been sourced. The main obstacle, however, is that if, in most of the cases, it is very difficult to identify the biological origin of many of these artifacts. This is because most of them are heavily worked. They can also be found degraded and almost uh, all the biological characters are usually absent so the microstructural or mineralogical features uh, in most cases are also insufficient in determining what kind of shells were actually made to use for making these ornaments and if it was really spondylus that we, was used to craft these artifacts. And this is where in my research I aim to understand if bimolecular approaches can be used for shell identification. In particular, can paloproteomics, the study of Asian proteins, um, can answer these questions about the biological origin of the shells. Paloproteomics in recent years has emerged as one of the most promising uh, techniques in molecular archaeology and paleontology. Um, it's been used to study different types of uh, artifacts as well as bones to, to answer also questions about human uh, evolution and it was also used to identify the oldest ever recorded prote Asian protein sequence that dates to 3.8 million years old from an ostrich eggshell. However, it, this approach has never been applied to model shells, mainly because of lack of research and mainly because we still have a um, very broad understanding about model shell systems. So, Smaller shells are organomineral nanocomposite materials made of calcium carbonate and a small fraction of organics. The mineral makes up the most of shell skeleton and it's either calcite, aragonite, or both. The biomolecules include proteins, carbohydrates. They're also a fraction of lipids, pigments, and other metabolites. And while it's a minor fraction of the shell, it's actually the most important agent that fine tunes the biomization, that is the growth of the mineral. And so the biomolecules and the mineral phase assemble in very complex and sophisticated uh, architectures the, and the most common microstructures in shells are known to be prismatic as well as nacres, which is commonly known as mother of the pearl, cross lamellar and foliated. Now a bit more information is known about shell proteins, mainly within the studies that were made in the field of organic geochemistry. So it is known that a fraction of proteins reside next to the mineral crystals, and they are noted as being intercrystalline. But there is also a fraction of proteins that during the bionization process get occluded inside the shell by a mineral, and so are also noted as intracrystalline. Well, these intracrystalline proteins, which can be isolated by bleaching treatment, in many shells uh, show a closed system behavior, 
what that means is that they are protected from rapid degradation, but also from environmental contamination. So if we, if we can access this intracrystalline proteins, we can also access the really endogenous mother shell sequences and study the biomization, as well as to understand what are the mechanisms of protein-mineral interaction and how actually maybe proteins degrade inside the biomineral. And so this is why it was very interesting if we can apply this knowledge to the shell, the spondylus, the most important shells in archaeology. It is also very interesting, the shell in biomization research, because it underwent a rather peculiar evolutionary pathway. Spondylus belongs to order pectinida, but its phylogenetic relationship with other pectinoid shells is quite debated. It's because pectinoid shells are calcitic, well, Spondylus shells are almost fully aragonitic. And spondylus also has a very complex microstructure uh, with, that composed, is composed of at least four different layers. And these type of shells with such complex microarchitectures are rather underrepresented in biomineralization research. So what's mainly interesting to understand, can we identify the biochemical properties of the shell and also the proteome composition? and also what kind of information can be obtained from shell sequences, and if we can use those for um, taxonomic identification. So first, I uh, use bleaching treatment for the shell to, in order to isolate only the mineral bound organics, and then I extract these organics using uh, a mild acid. So this shell organic matrix is actually, uh, if we test it in vitro with uh, calcium carbonate crystals, we can see that it strongly interacts with the presence of this matrix, the crystal shape gets completely deformed. And when I am to study proteomics, so I extract the proteins and I use liquid chromatography done together coupled with tandem mass spectrometry. To identify the proteins, I use a MOLUS protein database um, that also includes uh, proteins from other uh, species that have been studied before, such as several oysters, also the pectin shell, marine mussel, and pearl oyster, as well as others. So in spondylus, we could identify five proteins, which is not a lot, considering the dimensional um, systems you usually have. Um, you can have tens or even hundreds of proteins. And the coverage of most of the proteins was not high. However, almost all of the proteins were also identified from another pectinoid shell, which is actually the phylogenetically closest um, specimen to spondylus. And when I carry the detailed characterization of one of the most well-covered uh, top-scoring proteins in spondylus, I could see that the coverage mainly lie within conserved protein domains. And then there is a part of the sequence, which is in environmentalizing proteins called distorted region, that was completely uh, left uncovered. And this indicates that these regions evolved rather fast, and this is where precisely spondylus proteins were probably evolved. Now, I would like to go back a little bit with the proteomics data to explain why uh, such low number of proteins were identified. When proteins are analyzed by Tanama spectrometry, what we obtain is a product ion spectra that is searched again using a bioinformatics software called PEAKS in order to reconstruct these peptide sequences de novo. Those peptide sequences are then matched to proteins that are present in, in our provided database. So what I could see for spondylus is that uh, there were thousands of these de novo peptide sequences that actually left unmatched, which means that our database is only able to exploit a very small percentage of all the data that is generated. In simple terms, that means that spondylus proteome has lineage-specific sequences, so we don't have yet the uh, reference molecular data for the specimen. And this is a challenge when we want to characterize this binalizing spondylus proteome, and this is where uh, Assemble Plus project um, was about to help. So I aimed to get um, a transcriptome from the mantle, which is the main organ that produces the shell, uh, and in order to get it sequenced, I had to think of several challenges. First, I had to get live specimens, so I had to think well about the location. And because the labs where I was working uh, does, do not have access to marine biology institutes on the Mediterranean, nor the place where I was, uh, where I'm planning to sequence uh, it, I also had to um, 
think about the need of a professional diving team for sampling the specimen and also think of the best strategy how to do could it be done on lab or does it have to be on site and i was happy because Arsenal plus project granted me access to crete to the hcmr institute where in the beginning of 2020 just before the pandemic hit i was able to collect several uh, live spondylus specimens and we were able to uh, extract uh, the RNA from them. So the, spawn, the transcriptome is currently ongoing, uh, the sequencing analysis, University of Copenhagen, and this part will be very important for us in order to characterize the full uh, spondylus proteome of the shell. This data will also be very useful for, uh, for developing, further developing shell polyprotomics in order to study archaeological uh, shell ornaments and just test if these were actually made of the shell or could have been some others. And shell paleoprotomics has been incredibly useful in our previous study where we have studied uh, other types of small archaeological shell ornaments that were actually found to be made of freshwater mother of pearl shells, but not marine bivalves. And this study uh, was actually also the first paleoprotomic application to, to shell system. Now, I'm also interested in how stable are Asian shell protein sequences and if we can actually assess shell protein degradation in order to predict their survival in subfossil records. So the diagenesis, which is a sum of physical, chemical, biological processes that occur after the burial, when we talk about proteins, it, um, it comes with several main reactions. And I was mainly interested in understanding how protein hydrolysis occurs in shells. That is, can we actually trace how pre proteins break down in shell systems? And for these, I use artificial aging experiments that is by heating shells and high temperatures. So in this project, I'm using actually quite a novel technique that is called uh, quantitative proteomics with tandem mass tag labeling, which uh, provided a wealth of information enabling to understand mechanisms of how the proteins break down. What we were able to see uh, that the um, majority of proteins were stable even at high temperatures, meaning even uh, above 100 degrees, but the mechanisms of protein degradation were rather complex inside the shell biomineral. And together when spondylus transcriptome will be available, we'll, be, we'll also have opportunity to have a full picture of the whole different pathways that uh, how pro shell proteins degrade inside the environmental system. So in the future, uh, once um, this project is finalized, we, uh, the, the identification of spondylus proteome will help to also assess the evolution of the shell and also what are the characteristics of such robust structures and will also have a very strong impact in archaeological research. And this transcriptome will, of course, that be very useful in assessing protein degradation patterns, how do they break down in shells, but uh, also predicting if we can really find Asian spondylus sequences in subfossil records. Thank you very much for our listening presentation. And I also thank a lot of people who were participating in this project and in this research. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen. So um, that was uh, very interesting. Um, curious as well, because you, you wouldn't think that the, these proteins would last too long. Um, I'm actually a bit, curious because the examples of proteins that you gave, that you identified with the proteome, you know, one was a GPCR receptor, which, uh, you know, in principle is quite rare. I mean, the, the receptor should be not very abundant. And also the fact that you didn't seem to find more structural proteins. Uh, do you think, uh, is, you know, if there's any particular reason for this or what's your explanation? Yeah, so actually the main reason, as I explained in the presentation, is the lack of reference data for, for this model of species. So 
the proteins that I identified are, um, let's say, our results are actually biased towards what is present in the database. Because, uh, so what we found with the study that it, these proteins are likely have uh, quite linear specific sequences, so we're just not able to characterize the full set of, of proteins. Um, actually, the first protein, which uh, is named uncharacterized because it, it was never really investigated in other systems, it's uh, likely a structural protein. However, we don't really know uh, what function exactly it, it plays, uh, possibly with um, um, binding together with chitin and keeping the structure together. But again, this is also, um, I think, a bias that um, there is not much research in general on child proteins that are involved in biomization. And there is also very limited of models who have been studied. So it's mainly species that were of commercial importance. If we think about pearl oysters, because they're important in pearl industry. So the protein, the shell proteins that are in different types of shells, they can be quite different. And this is why we are not just easily able to identify them without um, a reference molecular data such as mm -hmm. genome or transcriptome. Mm -hmm. Good, that was good, thank you. Any thank other you questions? If not, well, thank you very much, but uh, we will have to wait uh, another nine minutes for the right time because otherwise people may, may want to listen to the talk and, uh, and the next talk and so, We'll wait. So meanwhile, uh, we'll be around. And um, thank you for our presentation again. Thank you. At NHBS, our purpose is to support those who are passionate about wildlife, ecology, and conservation. We stock a variety of books and equipment to suit the needs of marine conservation professionals and our innovation and research team are here to help develop custom products for any project. We are happy to provide advice and to support you before, during and after your purchase. Visit nhbs.com today to find out more. First Class Scientific Research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top-tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses, to cryobanking marine organisms, to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, or any other provision, Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. Hello, we are back. We're going to have uh, another interesting talk 
This time uh, it's by Peter Krut from the National University of Ireland in Galloway. And he is going to talk about bio-optical and biogeochemical properties of Atlantic phytoplankton. How one requests AIDS multiple projects. Please, Peter. Okay, well, thank you very much. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yeah, yeah you just have to uh, expand it. You know, to... Yep. Oh, it's not full screen? No, you have to uh, click on the, like, like a normal projection, you know. Uh, I think, hang on. Uh, I think you are doing right. Um, you still don't see full screen? No, it's just you have to click okay, on- Okay, just, just hang on a second. I, I know what this is. Is that better? Perfect. Yep. Okay. So, <coughs> sorry about that. Thank you very much for this opportunity to give a, a short little talk about what we've been doing via Assemble. Just to um, just to explain a little bit how this all worked. This is basically this was a, a relatively low cost uh, request to Assemble. It was for um, elements from the Roscoff Culture Collection or, or cultures from the Roscoff Culture Collection that were basically going to fill critical gaps in some of the phytoplankton species that we were looking at for actually three projects, which I'm going to give you a short introduction to. Um, some of them were e are EU projects that are ongoing, like Triatlas, which you can see here. And also one was a an Irish project, Nuts and Bolts, which I'll explain a little bit more uh, a bit later on. So what we were after was uh, some picoplankton, um, particularly Prochlorococcus. I'll explain a little bit about how that fed into some projects in a minute. Some coccolithophorids and some harmful algal bloom species. One thing here with the um, that's important just to note, and so I just make a quick slide on this, is about with any kind of um, animal materials or culture materials nowadays is to be able to make sure that uh, there is adherence to the Nagoya protocol to, con to the Convention for Biological Diversity. In this case, uh, virtually all of the cultures had been collected before the Nagoya protocol had come in. So there wasn't really an issue with this, but it's just so that uh, people who are watching are aware that this is, uh, something that uh, should be taken care of now with regard to making sure that um, that these biological resources are compliant with the rules. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is why we needed these cultures um, in terms of uh, the picoplankton. So in, in the Triatlas project, one of the aspects that we're looking at is the temporal and spatial variability in phytoplankton in the tropical and South Atlantic. That's the, the area which Triatlas um, is looking at. And so you've probably, most of you are very familiar with this graph here of showing you the different types of uh, seasonality that you get throughout the ocean. So most of the time we'd be expecting very, very little seasonality for tropical phytoplankton. But what we're looking at in this is we're looking at the seasonal amplitude of, of when the bloom is, the the month where the maximum occurs, how long that bloom might last, and what the um, variance is between seasons. And we're actually mostly looking at this through remote sensing data um, coming from the Copernicus uh, CMEMS data system. And we're also looking at it from, uh, from BioArgo data as well. So we're trying to combine those two, but as all of those are remote sense data, having information about the optical properties of the major phytoplankton species is a big help. And so that's where we needed to um, bring in the picoplankton. So just to give you an example of some of the remote sensing data we're looking at, we've got a study site that is off the northeast coast of Brazil, and this is the CMEMS time series. And if you boil all that down and just look at the individual data, you can get that there is a monthly um, or apparent monthly uh, of seasonal variation with being in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Southern Hemisphere winter, that you have higher chlorophylls. This is an oligotrophic tropical site. It has a, a relatively small seasonal cycle. But one of the interesting things about this is, is this temporal trend that we see here, is it real? 
does that actually occur in the ocean or is it an artifact of the data products that we're using? And the reason I say this is because in this region, it's very oligotrophic and the chlorophyll max is quite deep, 100, 120 meters or so. The satellite is probably only getting light reflected back from probably the upper 50 to 70 meters. So it may not be seeing where most of the chlorophyll is. So one of the questions is, does the deep chlorophyll max actually contribute to the satellite observations? Or is the reason why we get this just because in the winter there might be more mixing due to uh, higher wind speeds or something? Or is it uh, due to photo adaptation? There's slightly lower sunlight in the winter, I mean, it's the tropics, so it doesn't vary that much. So we're looking at a, lot, a number of different um, properties or the controlling um, effects on the bio-optical properties of these picoplankton. So how we do this is through a, a number of different ways. So uh, one of the species that, that's been, that we got from the Roscoff Culture Collection that was very useful for us was this low-light uh, uh, low prochlorococcus species and also a high-light one. Um, so we do this by using a number of different optical instruments. The first one is, is simply just a long path length cell, uh, which is one meter long, and we can just measure the absorbance of the cell straight away. This also includes the CDOM. We can then uh, filter that sample, and then we get a particular absorption. We can also filter it on, in this case, a small GFF, and then measure the absorption in the path length. And then basically, we get something similar to that. Um, except that this one has the CDOM, this one doesn't have the CDOM. And we can also get information from the flow cytometry as well um, about the number of cells, their DNA contents in this case. And so we can build, and we're still building up a library of all of these under various different conditions to then help us um, reinterpret uh, the uh, remote sensing data that we're looking at. There's a few other things we can do. We can use fluorescence. This is a, a marine Sinecococcus species that we got from Roscoff. Um, Brian Palinek had done some work almost 20 years or 20 years ago now, where you could see the, the changes in the uh, amounts of some of the different phycoerythrin and phycoerobilin uh, pigments as a function of irradiance and things. So we're looking at this as well. And for a lot of the places we were looking at, Sinecococcus don't make that, are not, that influential in the overall composition of the community, but um, it's still very useful to get some of this data out for some of these species. And this is where um, these culture collections have proven very, very valuable to us because it's kind of like getting a book out of the library uh, that you couldn't get hold of. But um, the book can also tell multiple stories as well if, if you change the conditions by how you read the book. So this is quite useful for us. Okay, the second uh, sort of project I want to talk about was where the um, Roscoff Culture Collection was able to fill quite a strategic gap in some work that we've been doing. In 2018, um, myself with some Chilean colleagues published some work on where we were copper stressing Emiliani Huxleyi, and um, they'd managed to gather a, a range of uh, locations from where they managed to get um, cultures growing from. Um, the biggest problem for us, though, was that we had none from anywhere near Ireland. And one of the um, projects we have at the moment is looking at remote sensing of, of these kinds of blooms. So luckily, the Roscoff Culture Collection had two uh, strains that were collected from near Ireland, from near the Irish coast. Although one of them is, and this is an interesting thing about with using with culture collections, one of them had gone from being a calcifying um, algae to being a non-calcifying algae. And so this is actually useful as well for a few things that we were looking at. So I'm gonna give you just a very brief introduction to membrane inlet mass spectrometry, which was one of the things that we've started applying to our, our cultures now. So in here is the, the membrane inlet mass spectrometer. This is a cuvette for um, growing cultures in. So you can, you can basically have your cultures growing under controlled conditions, temperature and light and so on, and be measuring essentially the dissolved gases that's in there with the MIMS. So typically we're measuring oxygen, nitrogen, argon, CO2 and dimethyl sulfide in the copper with cultures. 
But what I'm going to show you just a little bit on was some things that we've done recently to measure TCO2 in these cultures and also the particulate inorganic carbon. So one of the things we're looking at is how um, stresses might uh, alter the, the PIC in some of these cultures. So what we have here is, um, this is just a, a simple sample run that we ran. So we ran some acidified calcium carbonate standards. This is just the, the mass of, or the, the pressure that, at mass 44 that we're measuring. So this is basically proportional to the CO2 concentration. So this is acidified samples. So we're measuring basically all the um, inorganic carbon species. So we have here, we um, two cultures. Remembering the 1273 is the one that doesn't make coccolis. And you can see here that there's a difference between filtered and unfiltered samples. The days just means how many days since they were inoculated. One of the things we're looking at is how fast these cultures um, form and then how fast they decompose. So if we look here, this dif dif difference here is basically the PIC. So that's the coccolis. So we just dissolve the coccolis. Um, and so the difference between the filtered and the unfiltered. So in this case, the, this culture is basically take, um, form, take, used about half of the carbon that was in the system to make the PIC. If we look then 21 days later, um, or a sample that was 21 days older, a lot of that coccolith um, carbon has been basically remineralized and gone back into the, the water. So the in sort of summary, the, the one that formed the coccolis, we can see the basically the POC, I'm sorry, the PIC. We see also a little bit the difference between, say, here to here is maybe some remineralization of the POC. Um, and then for the one that didn't form any coccolis, there's maybe a little bit of POC as well. So this is giving us a relatively simple way of measuring the PIC and, and possibly the POC in some of these cultures. The third example that I just wanted to briefly touch on as well was one where we're looking at a, a marine transitional zone project and also a remote sensing project where we're looking at stresses in the marine transitional zones, but also looking at remote sensing of harmful algal blooms. And so um, this is a project which is funded by the EPA and the Marine Institute in Ireland. But it also, the nuts and bolts one is an Ember endorsed project. So this is quite good because it's another sort of international um, group that you can talk to about similar issues within the projects. So one of the focuses is here is actually on, on the mixoplankton side of the harmful algal blooms. So one of the issues is that we've been looking at uh, protozoan grazing. We'd also been looking at um, harmful algal blooms, and then most of the harmful algal bloom species seem to be mixotrophic. Um, some of them more so, well, some of them more so than others, and so on. And so, I'm just giving this this uh, single slide here on, or actually, it's two slides on a recent paper that's looked at calling some of these species mixoplankton and redefining them because so many um, organisms were being found to be not only phototrophic but uh, phagotrophic as well. And so in the Flynn paper, what they've done is they, they then um, evolved the system into four uh, or six different kinds overall of um, new types of, or new descriptions for plankton and mixoplankton. So I'm not gonna go into any details here, but if you're interested, you should look this paper up to, to get some more context for that. So the way that we've been uh, working in the field is basically to identify protists or mixoplankton using flow cytometry. And most of the time we're using this approach that was put forward by Rose et al. in 2004 using the, the lysotracker green stain. So basically what this does is it stains the food vacuoles of the protozoans and the uh, mixotrophs as well and then it stains them so they fluoresce green. So you're able to detect them in the flow cytometer as green in this. Now, using this standard approach, you actually take all the phototrophs out so you don't get the mixotrophs. Um, but what we've been looking at is then also looking at what's in the phototrophs and what also stains as well to see what have got phototroph and mixotroph parts. So here's an example for one of the um, 
herb species that we got from um, Roscoff. So this is the, the raw um, red fluorescence, so the chlorophyll fluorescence versus size. So you can see there's a nice population of the uh, Alexandra in there. This is basically their green fluorescence here um, and their size here as well. This is now with the Lysotracker green. So we don't see any real change between the chlorophyll fluorescence, but we see quite a shift as we would expect in the green fluorescence. But there's a couple of things here. The first one is that there's an awful lot of auto green fluorescence in the raw um, dinoflagellate here. There's an awful lot of green fluorescence. So these would actually even be, these would actually plot in the realm of uh, heterotrophic nanoflagellates already. Um, so that this is one thing that's been in the literature before that you do have to be careful with some of these staining techniques because some of the algae already have a, a very high natural green fluorescence themselves. Similarly, looking at, at Karenia, um, again, same sort of thing. There's no difference with between staining and not staining for the chlorophyll fluorescence. Um, you can see that there also has a very high green fluorescence. And you can see here that the green fluorescence increases actually much more markedly than does it did for the Alexandrum. So that this is looking like a promising technique for trying to assess some of these uh, mixotropes. Admittedly, so far we haven't had, and luckily we have not had a natural event with any of these to test things out. But it's, this is where, again, having the opportunity to get into the culture collections and grab some of these species and then test some of these ideas out um, means that you've got all of these techniques tested before you go to use them in the field. So just a little bit on, on what we're planning to do with the same sort of cultures in the future. There's been a, a number of papers, and this one's probably the, the most recent with uh, giving a good example, where there's these links between multi-environmental stresses and herb species. So that um, not only uh, well, when you have all these um, combination of, of stresses on the marine ecosystems, it can uh, lead to an increase in HABs, but then the HABs themselves can also become another stressor on the environment. And so this has been discussed in Ireland before about the fact that when you get these blooms of Karenia, they can have quite an influence on the dissolved oxygen levels. So one of the things, because our MIMS is well uh, set up for looking at that, we're going to start looking at respiration rates of Karenia using the MIMS. Look at other species as well, but that's the one just to start with. So then I'd just like to um, give some acknowledgements, particularly to Assemble for providing such a great opportunity to Roscoff for providing the cultures and all of their help there. And then all of the, the different funding agencies and uh, international programs that we've been a part of. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Peter. Interesting uh, bits of research. Uh, I've got a, a question uh, in related a bit with what uh, this last part of the harmful alg algal blooms. How far are we from, uh, you know, basically being able to predict uh, the, these kind of, uh, of uh, toxic uh, blooms? I'm thinking about, you know, uh, for example, shellfish. Uh, producers and so on, which of course are a primary uh, problem for them. So in that regard, there are, there are a number of things where, or a number of new uh, advances in the last few years, particularly um, the, the remote sensing group at Plymouth have an, have an algorithm for basically um, spotting Karenia blooms as early as possible. Um, and then there are other groups that have combined them with um, regional models to try and give some sort of probability or prediction for when that bloom might grow a little bit more and then move inshore or something like that or develop inshore. The thing is, is that um, th there's a couple of things like my group's been involved with, with a remote sensing application of this too. And we've got a paper that's uh, been submitted on that. And certainly it's, it's getting better, but I don't, you know, there's certainly a lot of room to uh, mm. get a lot better because I think one of the things is, particularly for Western, Western Europe, is that it's often very cloudy as well. Uh -huh. So 
um, the, the, the chances that all of these things could be happening during the week of when you have cloud or something, which means there's no re new remote sensing data coming in is mm -hmm. a problem. But um, so then having uh, potentially something like gliders or uh, Argo or something else providing data on those sorts of things from key areas, say like the Celtic Sea, for instance, would, would yeah. be a big help. So you, you need to have something, some, some sensors down in the water so that you can help. Yeah, there are, there are a few um, sensors too where they've gone more the omics side. Um, and the problem with those is that they normally are deployed and then have to be recovered. So you only find out afterwards that you had, you know, you know the something yeah. was there. Um, and so it's it's the the difference between uh, real time monitoring and predictive monitoring, I think. But there's certainly a lot of efforts going towards to to increase the um, ability to to make accurate predictions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to ask questions? Well, thank you, Peter. It seems like there's no more questions. Thank you. So we'll have to wait a little bit again until 1330s. Well, at least uh, here, 1430 there, uh, in other places to, uh, for the next one. Hello, welcome back. We are at the Assemble Plus conference. And uh, the next talk will be by Fabrizio Frontalini from the University of Urbino in Italy, uh, who is going to talk about venting monitoring of highly polluted Gulf of Bagnoli in Italy using foraminiferal environmental DNA and morphological analysis. Initially, this talk has been, was uh, submitted by Jan Pavlovsky from the University of Geneva and they co collaborate, but in the end, Jan could not make it. So Fabrizio, please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon to anybody. And uh, first of all, I need to thank the Assemble Plus and in particular the Stazione Zoologica Anton Dorn as a SIS provider. And this presentation relies on the application of foraminifera using two different approaches. That is the uh, environmental DNA metabar coding and the morphological approach for understanding the quality, the ecological quality of a marine environment, a particular polluted environment that is Bagnoli. And we now know that human activities have deeply affected marine environments and particularly the coastal area, the results as one of the most impact ecosystem on earth. And because of the biodiversity loss, because of the environmental crisis and so on. So many worldwide marine legislation have emphasized the role of biological indicator or bioindicator and in order to establish the ecological quality status of water bodies. So um, to effectively assess the, the, the global change and developmental stress, it is important to find optimum ecological indicator. So like uh, forums, foraminifera, but also to understand the environmental recent transformation. So for example, to understand the deviation from the references conditions. We now know that pollution is a problem that affects all marine systems and they mainly occur as organic enrichment, toxic contamination, but also as emerging pollutants like uh, engineering nanomaterials, fiber, personal care products, and pharmaceutical. And ventiforaminifera have been widely used in different disciplines over science and particularly by geologists, and more recently, even in environmental biomonitoring. Um, Bentiforaminifera have a widespread distribution, so they can be found in all marine and transitional marine environments. When I'm talking about transitional marine environment, I refer to coastal lake, lagoons, marsh, and so on. Again, uh, bentiforums are also quite small. They are on micrometer size and they are quite abundant, especially when compared to other hard shell taxa. They have a high biodiversity. They are quite easy to collect. So even when we have a small uh, volume of available sediment, we can find a very high number that can be processed under statistical uh, point of view. They also have a short and reproductive, uh, short life reproductive cycles and specific ecological requirements. 
all of them taken together make sure that Foraminifera may react quickly to environmental change and they can be used as an early warning um, by indicator for both short and long-term changes in all marine and transitional marine environment. Um, first of all, we need to understand how foraminifera are related to the environment where they live. And this can be achieved by studying uh, their um, assemblages, so the foraminifera assemblages, by investigating the diversity, abundance, species composition, and so on. So for example, when we deal with um, a good environment that can be defined as a well oxygenated with the no main source of pollution and physical chemical parameters that are quite stable, we expect to find a very highly diversified ventiforaminiferal assemblages with the presence of generalist species, the low, low percentages of abnormal or peritized specimen and no DARF specimen. On the other hand, when we deal with the bent environment, so those kind of environments that are uh, marked by highly polluted conditions or oxygen depleted conditions or unstable physical, chem physical chemical parameter, we expect to, to see, to observe a uh, poorly diversified uh, foraminiferal assemblages that is dominated by a few opportunistic species, high percentages of abnormal and peritized specimen, and also DARF specimen, the so-called Lilliput effect. So in other terms, they, um, they are quite reduced in their dimension. And the investigated area is Bagnoli. Bagnoli is located in the northern western sector of Naples in southern Italy. And it is characterized by a very high concentration of heavy metals, hydrocarbon, in particular polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, and particularly in front of the former plant area. And in 2002, in 2000, it was uh, declared the site as a site of national interest because of the pollution problem. So just for having an idea of um, the story of Bagnoli, Bagnoli um, has a long legacy of contamination. And the first activity start at the beginning of um, 19th centuries. And um, there were um, these changes um, were accompanied by different, um, different variation, for example, the construction of two piers. To, to allow the, 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 ass the, the access of the factory of large ships. And in 1935, um, the, the coastal area was connected with the island of Nisida and uh, by the construction of a long strip of land. The development peak was in 1960 and the main uh, factory involved were still concrete and ethernet factories that they were um, still active up to 1992. And um, since now the conditions are quite um, polluted and different remediation program has been planned, but not completely um, carried out. And the area, uh, we sample like um, 12 uh, station and uh, along four main transect, uh, as you can see in this uh, figure from like a four transect from B1 to B4. And, and this, the, the site was sampled according to the water depth, so from spanning from 10 meters through 20 up to 40 meter depth. And these sediment samples were collected by um, a box core and in uh, September um, 2019. And um, the different sediment samples were uh, divided in different subsamples for different analysis, both abiotic analysis like a grain size, geochemical analysis that were performed at the ACME laboratories in Canada through uh, aqua regional digestion and ICPMS analysis. The organic matter characterization was done at the, at the access provider and also some biotic analysis, including the bentiforaminiferal assemblages analysis uh, using two different approaches, uh, the eDNA metabarcoding at the University of Geneva in Switzerland and the morphological analysis uh, here at Urbino University. And for the morphological analysis, we follow the protocol of FOBIMO that is, was a protocol that was uh, uh, published in 2012 and that it, it is like for the standardization of the methodological approach. And um, there's of course some differences between the different, uh, the different approach. The classical approach is the micropaleontological approach. So it is like uh, using 
a sediment that is stained with the rose bengal that allow the recognition and the separation of living specimen at the moment of collection from those that were not living. And the metabolic coding is there, is there is uh, like uh, the, um, the real approach of the um, molecular ecology. So it is like a sequencing. And so the identification of the different operational taxonomy unit that, that are the, the, the component of the assemblages. And for different indexes that have been considered, for example, the Foramambi, that is um, a new index that was based on, it is exactly the same of AMBI, but instead of being based on macrofauna, it is based on foraminifera. And additional, um, there were even considered additional indexes like um, the, um, the Shannon Weaver diversity, the Foraminifera stress index, and so on. And this is for understanding the relationship between the contamination or the environmental stress and the change into the, the foraminiferal assemblages in both the molecular data set and in the morphological one. And specifically, the, um, the, um, the Sean Weaver index was applied just for the metabar coding uh, data set. So um, the upon sampling, the sediment for the metabar coding for the eDNA was immediately preserved in a, a preservation, in a, in a solution that is a lifeguard preservation solution. Then it was extracted DNA and then was, um, was target a specific sequence that is the fragment spanning from 37 to 41 F fragment. And then was amplified and it was applied like a bioinformatic approach and um, to for, um, for uh, filtering some data and sequences. And then the so obtained sequences were assigned to operational taxonomy units. And here are the first results that we come up with. And in particular, here are the statistics, the spatial analysis, the spatial distribution of the grain size, specifically the, the mud content and the organic matter. So as we can clearly see, is that here are the two piers. This is the uh, former industrial uh, site of Bagnoli. And we see that, for example, the TOC uh, show very high content and very high values exactly in correspondence of the northern pier. And we also use the toc TN ratio for understanding the origin of the organic matter. So not only the content, but also the origin, the source, and the quality of the organic matter. Then two indexes were used for um, synthesizing um, the um, two pollution index were used for understanding the, um, to, for identifying the area that is most affected by pollution. And particularly, we used the uh, modified degrees of contamination and the pollution or index of Tomlinson. And again, we see that the area in front of the industrial uh, site was um, is particularly polluted. And particularly if we consider the pollution on index, uh, we observe that the station that are at 40 meter water depth uh, show value particularly high of pollution on index. So it is like a very high, can be like a, categorized as a very highly polluted area. And then we perform a statistical analysis, a very basic Q-mode cluster analysis that was based just on abiotic parameters. So we consider the um, pollution or index, um, the contamination factor, the mud content, and the organic matter characterization. And we identified two main clusters. The first cluster that is represented by AA is the is character is a, in the, it is represented by only two transect that is B1 and B2, regardless of the water depth. And this can be defined as the not contaminated or poorly contaminated area. On the other hand, the cluster B um, is the most polluted area, and it is uh, further subdivided in two subcluster, B1 and B2. They represent, in this case, uh, B1, the shallowest station, so like a 10 and 20 meters water depth, and the B2, those station in front of the industrial plant, uh, place at 40 meters water depth. 
And here we see uh, a plot of um, the diversity indexes that have been computed on the foraminiferal DNA data set. And we see, for example, that this area, again, in front of the industrial complex, show a higher value of uh, dominance, or if you prefer, um, or in other terms, like a lower level of diversity indexes, particularly like uh, the Shannon um, Weaver indexes, the modified Shannon Weaver diversity indexes. And here we see, for example, um, a core diagram, and that is to understand how uh, the main autos or group of autos change in relation to the different stations. So for example, we, we can observe for the uh, monothalamia, um, one group of forums, uh, show a higher abundance at B3, B4 uh, transect that are those that are more polluted. On the other hand, textularids and rotalids, they, seems, uh, they seem to have an opposite behavior. So they are relatively more abundant at B1 and B2. Then we also plot the, um, the diversity indexes computed on the morphological data set. And again, we found that the area in front of the industrial complex, in, the, but in this case in the southern pier, show um, higher values of dominance and the lower value of uh, Shannon Weaver uh, diversity index. And so we try to correlate the different computed diversity indexes, like um, the diversity indexes or the foraminifera stress indexes or the FMB. Um, they were like a, um, statistically um, related through um, correlation analysis with the pollution index and the TOC content. And what we found out is that um, or, or mostly all the different parameters show a negative correlation with the pollution index and the TOC. Uh, the only exception is represented by the diversity indexes of the morphological data set. But this is because um, we found on, we, um, we collect only a very limited number of specimen. And this is because um, the, the area is particularly polluted. So it's very hard to find truly living forums. And particularly um, because according to the FOBIMO protocol, uh, the fraction that would be processed would have been uh, the fraction over 125 micrometers. But because we found only a very limited number of living forums, we were forced to process even the finer fraction. So from 63 to 125. On the other hand, the, um, the DNA data set, and particularly the diversity indexes, the diversity, the diversity index calculated on the DNA data set show a very negative correlation with the TOC, but also with the pollution oil index that mainly represent the organic enrichment or the inorganic um, contamination. And then we perform a principal component analysis. Um, with a principal component analysis, we use as a primary variables, uh, the abiotic variables, so the pollution on index, the mud content, and the characterization of the, of the organic matter. And we see that, for example, uh, the first uh, component that explain over 78% of the total variance is strongly related to the pollution gradient and to the organic matter enrichment and to the mud content. And then as a secondary variable, we plot over the relative abundance of morphological uh, of the morphological species. So the one on the on the top on the left part of the and, and the top corner of this diagram, the unassigned operational taxonomy unit from the molecular data set, the monothalamia and the globothalamia. What was very curious is that um, there was um, a somewhat a similar behavior between uh, the species uh, identified in the morphological data set and those autos um, in the molecular data set. For example, we see here in red the bulimina longata that is um, negatively related to the first axis. And here we see in red, again, the bulimina longata in the, in the molecular data set. So it is somewhat we obtain for the first time a very clear match between uh, the morphological and the molecular data set. 
Of course, uh, most of the um, we we um, after um, the the filtering on the on the eDNA data set, we obtain a, a lot of values, uh, and only a tiny fraction of them were assigned. I would say like a um, something like a 10% of the audios. And, um, but some of them show like a clear relation, um, a clear match with the morphological data set. And here we plot the, um, the uh, diversity exponent, the modified shallow weaver diversity uh, calculated for the eDNA data set. And we see the again the area in front of the industrial complex of Bagnoli show um, the lowest value of diversity, and our future um, aim is to understand if this variation can be somewhat matched with um, can be used for understanding the ecological for defining the ecological quality status in the in the area. So by concluding, uh, the area is a very highly contaminated, particularly the area in front of the former industrial area. We have a clear separation between in, in the closer or shallower station with the deeper one. And this is because the deeper one, they have a higher mud content. So in terms even a high TOC and higher contamination degree. We, uh, we found um, negative correlation between the contamination, like a pollution or index, but even TOC, and most of the foraminifera ecological indexes, both for, uh, for both the molecular and morphological data set. And in terms of the Shannon Weaver, we um, came up with the idea that probably the molecular data set outperformed the morphological uh, one. And this is because it is um, it, contain, it contains a lot of sequences and a lot of reads, so it's more reliable. So again, the DNA metabarcoding is confirmed to be an excellent tool in the environmental assessment and monitoring. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, Fabrizio. Sounds uh, like as if you managed to, to get some interesting data there. So. I, I found it curious, maybe, I, I mean, I, of course, I'm not uh, familiar with this kind of group of organisms, but uh, when you look, you, you, the, the, the pollution doesn't seem to eliminate any group in some ways, it's more changing the abundant, ab abundance, uh, so that, of course, that affects diversity, but it's from your uh, scheme, it's not like as if they suddenly there is a species that disappears. Uh, what you seem to change, what changes maybe their competition or something like that? Yeah, it yeah. might be possible. What we, um, what we found is definitely like a change in diversity and so change in terms of a alpha diversity, but also in beta diversity. So in terms of compositional change of the assemblages. And at the moment we are working on identifying potentially, at least for the autos, assigned autos that can be considered as, as more tolerant or more sensitive to pollution. Okay, and, some indicator. Yes, yes. And possibly they can be used in a sort of um, GMB, so an AMB based on genetic. Mm -hmm. So do you think when you say that there is a better correlation with the uh, EBAR coding, um, do you think that there are cryptic species also there? Yeah, it might be possible because um, if we compare the two data sets, for example, for the morphological data set, we identify something like 60 bentiforaminiferal species. Mm -hmm. And for the, um, for the molecular data set, we obtain something like um, uh, 12,000 odd use. And only uh, 130, if I correct in mind, so something like 10% are assigned. Mm -hmm. So we try to combine if there were some sequences that they can be identified as a, the same morpho species. And um, yes, there could be like even some cryptic species. This is a this might be like a increase the diversity of the molecular data set. In any case, um, it's um 
Um, I didn't want to say that the morphological data set didn't work because, for example, for different indexes, it performs quite well. The problem is the lower, uh, the very low abundance of living foraminifera in terms of morphological species. Mm -hmm. And that might, might have affected the, uh, the correlation. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, there's a comment saying how great talk it was and no questions, it seems. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio. We'll have to wait another four minutes for the next one, five minutes, and okay. then we'll have the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. The marine environment is a rich and largely unexplored reservoir of biodiversity with vast potential for food, health and biotechnology. The European Marine Biological Resource Centre, EMBRC, is a research infrastructure which aims to unlock the knowledge and innovation potential of our oceans. It enables researchers and companies to access marine organisms, expertise and experimental facilities to study them. Headquartered in Paris, EMBRC brings together 45 sites in nine member countries. We provide access to specialist facilities and services that enable researchers from academia and industry to study marine life and develop innovative solutions to address societal challenges like climate change and health and food sustainability. We support both fundamental and applied research, particularly for areas like biodiscovery, biotechnology, aquaculture, biodiversity, and climate change research. EMBRC supported research has already led to novel, high impact research in human health, product and medicine development, and aquaculture. And it's helping us to fully grasp the crucial role of ocean life. EMBRC has benefited hundreds of researchers across Europe and beyond, delivering robust and efficient services and expertise to help users obtain the best possible results. So EMBRC is continuing to develop its services. We're working to start recording biodiversity at many of our sites using molecular techniques to put in place so-called genomics observatories. This will allow us to have a much better understanding of how our oceans function and their current health. In addition, we're increasing our bioprospecting capabilities to better support the development of new products and solutions from the sea. EMBRC is a single access point to remote and on-site services in Europe, supporting marine research and innovation across borders. Research relies on effective, convenient access to tools, facilities, and data. Assemble Plus is a European Union funded research and innovation program with a consortium of over 20 partners that integrates key marine research facilities across Europe and beyond, offering access to top tier research infrastructure through a competitive application procedure, evaluated on the basis of a feasibility assessment and research excellence. Whether from academia, industry or policy, through its easy and straightforward application process, Assemble Plus provides scientists with on-site or remote access to biological resources, varied ecosystems, experimental facilities, technology platforms, e-infrastructure and expertise, and provides lodging and catering support over the course of their placement. Assemble Plus also performs its own networking and research activities, ranging from interacting with new users and businesses to cryobanking marine organisms to providing diving services for researchers. Over the course of the project, as well as providing access, Assemble Plus aims to strengthen transnational and multidisciplinary networks, create public-private partnerships, enable new technologies and services, upskill researchers, and improve the long-term sustainability of Europe's marine biological stations. So, if you are a researcher in need of access to marine infrastructure, such as laboratories, equipment, 
or any other provision. Assemble Plus welcomes proposals for access on a rolling basis from the 29th of August 2018 to the 30th of October 2020. For more information about the project and call for access, please visit www.assembleplus.eu. So welcome, uh, welcome back. We're going to have now the last talk for this afternoon. So it's the by Chiara Conte from uh, Tor Vergata University of Rome. And she's going to talk about the succession of, over time of the leaves epiphytic microbial community associated with the seagrass, Alophila stipulase, the Red Sea. Please, Chiara, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me share the screen. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Okay, so good afternoon again. Thanks everybody for being here and assemble class and all the staff for this opportunity. With this presentation, I would like to share with you some results that you obtained with a project carried out thanks to the assembled fundings within the frame of my PhD. My PhD, um, sorry. My PhD uh, focused on the seagrass olobiont, and with the term olobiont, we refer to the association between the host and all the associated microorganisms. I focus mainly on, bac I focus on bacteria, but of course, within the olobiont, we should uh, consider also um, fungi and viruses and all the associated microorganisms. The host and the microbes establish transient and long lasting relationships. That, are, that constitute a complex functional unit and are, that are able to respond jointly to environmental changes. This means that the host and microbial interaction play a crucial role in, the, in all, almost every aspect of the organism life, from the physiological to the ecological function. This concept has been applied so far to many different organisms, including humans, plants, marine organisms like corals, fungi, and of course, seagrass. Seagrass from their side provide diverse microenvironments and organic carbon to the bacteria that, um, that in turn um, provide um, many different functions. In fact, due to their um, role in the biogeochemical cycles, bacteria uh, enhance nutrients availability, break down phytotoxic compounds like hydrosulfuric acid that is known to be responsible for massive uh, seagrass they are, but they also able, bacteria are also able to produce antimicrobial and anti-fouling compounds that could enhance the seagrass defense, potentially produce plants hormone-like compounds that could have a role in seagrass growth. This means that microbes may enhance the host adaptiveness in a changing environment. So the seagrass or the biont composition is is probably the result of a balance between beneficial and detrimental relationships. Because of course, microbes could also be pathogens. Um, um, many factors probably um, influence its composition. Environmental conditions, the environmental microbial pool, and recent studies suggest that also the host species and the host ecological and health condition may have a role in this. Understanding the variation of the microbiota associated with the seagrass could be important from an ecological point of view because microbes being faster than the host to react to the environmental changes and more sensitive than the host could represent a putative seagrass monitoring tool. So in this frame, to try to address at least one aspect of this huge question, we have analyzed the um, development of the epiphytic microbial communities associated with the leaves of Alophila stipulatia, that is a cigarette in the Red Sea. Um, as said before, this, um, this study has been carried out in the Red Sea, thanks to the assembled funding and to the IUI that hosted us. The, sample, the sampling um, took place in North Beach, that is a touristic bay, where was found um, a continuous monospecific meadow, that started around four meters depth and go on to 13 meters depth and beyond. We decided to collect plants at three different depths, whereas four, nine, and 14 meters, 
and we divided the leaves uh, in four class H according to the order of the shoot um, in respect of the apical shoot. In fact, we know that this species grows forward the apical shoot um, with a rate of around one new shoot per week. We decided to consider the second shoot, the fourth, the sixth, and the tenth. As you can observe from the picture, the younger leaves are tiny, clear, and almost transparent. While getting older, the leaves get darker. We can see more um, macro epibionts, and eventually they break. So at each depth, the meadow has been uh, um, the cover meadow has been uh, measured, and also the leaves area. Then a pool of twelve leaves of the same. Uh, shoot order um, uh, as was was pulled for a for was used in a one replicate and the macro and what the microbial biofilm was uh, was collected with a handmade washing solution that we've used before for this purpose and from from the from this solution the 16 as RNA gene has been amplified and then analyzed within the software channel too. So from the results um, the cover showed to significantly increase within depth. And these results could, um, a possible explanation for, for this result could due to the fact that Alatlas stipulasia has a pioneer, is a pioneer species and also have a delicate, uh, delicate root structure. This, um, this suggests that this species may thrive better in deeper site with low, it, lower hydrodynamic condition. The leaf area analysis show that it increases across shoot order and also across depth. In fact, comparing leaves of the same uh, shoot, uh, shoot age, leaves of the same age, but from different sites, we can see that there is a significant difference, but also that this increase is, in, is higher with the, at the deeper sites. In fact, also comparing the, uh, the leaf area of different leaves age, but from the same side, we obtain significant results in deeper side, but not at the shallow side. This result was set before, and it's probably due to the fact that Alafla compensates light reduction, increasing the leaves area. The microbial uh, community associated with, the, with this, uh, with this cigarette leaves are clustered uh, by sites rather than by depth, sorry, rather than with age. Um, and we can also observe that um, among the samples from the, from the shallow site that are the green one, there is a higher distance. So that means that they are more diverse among each other. Uh, Permanava testa suggests that both depth and age have a role in, um, in establishing this, this, uh, this diversity, but depth is as clearly a higher influence in this. Observing the diversity, we can see that uh, the Shannon index in the shallow side is constantly high, while and also the, the overall better diversity. In uh, the deep side, in the deep uh, side insects show an increase of diversity from young to old leaves. This result was obtained before by a recent studies focused on Posidonia cyanica. Of course, Posidonia is a completely different species and Mediterranean Sea is different from the Red Sea. However, for my best knowledge, this is the only study that consider that compare from a microbial point of view young and old leaves. So it's the only um, available reference at the moment. From a taxonomic point of view, we can see again that uh, microbes can be clustered by depth. And we can clearly see the high diversity we mentioned before in the shallow side. And in particular, we can observe that there is a high abundance of bacteria like Enterobacteriaceae that are usually related with anthropogenic impact. While in the deep side, we can observe the abundance of few families and the dominance of this family. Uh, in particular, in the nine meters, we found alpha proteobacteria, and in the deepest side, gamma proteobacteria. The transient um, uh, abundance, I mean, the abundance of the anthrobacteriaceae, but in, in, within transient relationship with the seagrass was observed before by different studies. 
while uh, um, the alpha proteobacteria was as associated with this species I found before by many studies, while the, the found of the dominance of the gamma proteobacteria is, a, uh, is a new found, no, no, what, no was, wasn't uh, found by other studies before. Then we analyzed the structure of the community with these pen uh, diagrams that show the shared and the unique OTUS. With OTUS, I mean the, the, the units in which are grouped the 16S RNA gene similar that are attributed to the same taxonomic group. And again, we can find similarities between the deep side um, compared to the shallow side. In fact, in the shallow side, we saw a higher abundance of unique OTUS in the youngest and oldest leaves, while in uh, both deep side, nine and in the, the one at nine and uh, 14 meters, we observe a quite similar distribution of the OTUS across uh, this age. Observing the overall macrobial community, uh, we observed a decrease of unique to us from shallow to deep side. And again, this, um, this underlined the, the richness and the diversity we observed, we mentioned before in the shallow side. However, this, uh, uh, between the three depths, there is a shared uh, microbial component that we can call core microbiota that uh, from a taxonomic point of view was constituted mainly by uh, gamma proteobacteria, in particular the Bionasia, but also from rare uh, alpha proteobacteria, in particular families, families that are included in, uh, in that are involved, sorry, in uh, sulfur, carbon, and nitrogen cycles. This suggests that the core microbiota, whereas the, com the microbial component that is permanently associated with the seagrass, is, um, is probably composed by environmentally abundant and opportunistic microbes, like gamma proteobacteria, but also uh, probably by microbes that may have key functional role in the serious all biont. So, um, in conclusion, uh, we can um, affirm that the difference that we observed in the microbial colonization across depth uh, is due to the hydro, potentially due to the hydrodynamics. In fact, in the shallow side, the higher hydrodynamics condition may erode the stability of the microbial uh, community assembly, while in the deep side, the increase of leaves area, but also the low hydrodynamics may allow the development of a more structured microbial succession. Um, the difference observed uh, instead across shoot age are probably due to the eukaryotic, eukaryotic epithets that um, for sure contribute to the microbial higher diversity and, the, and they are and that are more abundant on old leaves compared to the young leaves. Um, and also probably to the host physiology uh, changes due to the aging pro process that may affect the microbial biofilm. And this has, um, this change has been assessed by a recent study. So this probably could be an influencing factor in the microbial biofilm. So in conclusion, we can say that this study um, confirmed the high plasticity of this species in different environmental conditions, in particular in the percentage of middle cover and leaves area across that, and it's probably an adaptation to different light uh, conditions. And um, we can say that the microbial communities varies across depth, mainly from a taxonomic point of view, but also across, um, across leaves age in terms of community structure. This means that the environment is probably the main driver in shaping the epipedic microbial community, but also um, we observe a changes in the, in the epipedic biofilm according to the host features, but, but uh, these changes probably do also to intrinsic biofilm dynamics. So we can say that the whole biome as a whole gets pulled together, but of course further studies are needed to to, um, to improve the, the knowledge of this uh, aspect of the series all about With that, I would like to thank all the people that participated to the study, again, the Assembly Plus and the IUI, and all of you for your kind attention, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Chiara. So in, the, in relation to the last point that you made about uh, possible links to the physiology, 
like is there, are you doing anything on in that or it's just an idea well um a recent studies suggest that there is a different gene expression and also antioxidant activity between young and old beliefs of Allophila stipulacea. We also um, observe that seagrass produce metabolites. So um, I think that could be an, this could have a role in, in influencing the microbial communities. We still don't know exactly how, but probably the metabolites, um, but also um, substances like phenols um, may have a role in, um, in this, I think. But so, you, haven't, you haven't started working on that part? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? Seems as if not. Seems to be been quite clear, and uh, I guess you enjoyed your visit to a lot. Yeah, yeah, I did. Sure. <laughs> Let's see the picture. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, just uh, remind you. you that tomorrow we start at nine thirty uh, European Central Time with a, a talk by Marianne, Marina. Arnone from Station Zoologica on uh, basically embryology, gene regulatory networks for evolution and development. And then uh, we, we carry on with some other presentations from uh, different um, marine stations. So I hope to see you tomorrow. So good afternoon, everyone, and until tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye.